God compares an akazu so that my household can be full. So when a principality brings government, you need another agent to compare people to come. You can build a church but to be empty. And forever you are God. We bless you Lord, you are holy. And forever you are God. And forever you are God. We bless you Lord, you are holy. And forever you are God. And forever you are God. We bless you Lord. We give you praise. We give you glory. In Jesus' precious name, we've given thanks. Please be seated. If that's all you learn tonight, it's enough. <laughs> you know, sometimes you don't need so much. Just understand the one you know and apply it. The secret of victory in life is revelation and consecration. That's the secret, the summary of victory in life. Revelation and consecration. If you don't know, you are in trouble. He said, my people perish for the lack of knowledge. God didn't deny them. He called them his people. My people, not strangers. My people perish for the lack of knowledge. So the people of God perish if they don't have revelation. And then if you know and you are not committed to doing, you will still not make progress. That's the problem of many. They know so much, but they are doing nothing. But they are those who know little, and they are committed to that little, and God keeps increasing them. Because you need to demonstrate what you know by your commitment in doing. He said, if you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. So there is a place of consecration. If you marry revelation and consecration together, your life is unstoppable. That's the secret of exploit. They that know their God, they shall be strong and do exploit. And they that know their God must obey his counsels and his commandments. That's the proof that they love him. And that's when their lives begin to produce results. Praise God. But tonight, that's not my teaching. We come back to the doctrine of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. And tonight, we are going to look at the doctrine of Christ. Why is the sound like this? We'll look at the doctrine of Christ. But let me do a quick recap. Five minutes. And today, five minutes will be five minutes. Glory to God. <laughs> I'm timing myself now. So we began under the doctrine of God to look at, first of all, the proofs for the existence of God. And we itemized a few of them. I think about eight of them. We looked at the cosmological evidence and we said God exists because nothing begins on its own. Because there is creation, there of necessity must be creator. And so we said that creator is the one we call God. We looked at the teleological evidence and we said that argument is the argument of design. And when we look at creation, creation is too orderly to have come from a random occurrence. And so because of the orderly nature of creation, we argued that there must be someone behind it sustaining it. And the Bible corroborates that emphasis. In Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3, he said he sustains all things by the word of his power. So creation is not just random because there is the power sustaining it. Creation did not just appear because someone created everything. Genesis 1 verse 1. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And then we went further to look at. Um, what's the third argument we looked at now? The. Okay let me put them randomly. Anthropological argument. 
which is the argument of man. We said man is a reflection of God. The Bible says man was created in the image of God. And most of the things we discover about God, we discover that man models those things. For example, we saw that the mode of God's existence is as a triune being. And when we looked at man, we saw that man also is a triune being. He has spirit, soul, and body. We see that man has a soul, he has a mind, he has a motion. And the Bible reveals to us that virtually every attribute that we possess, God possessed them. And when God decided to manifest in a visible form, the form God took was the form of man. So we said, man is a proof of God's existence, right? We spoke about the biological argument, and we said, as far as biology is concerned, every life comes from an existing life. No life just begins. You cannot see anything in existence that did not come from another life that already existed. And so we said, because there is life on earth, of necessity there must be a life giver. And we say that life giver is God. And then we also looked at um, the moral argument. And we said, every created being has an intuitive law on its inside that makes him distinguish between good and evil. And he doesn't just distinguish between good and evil. There is an inner responsibility he has towards sustaining good while he negates evil. And we said, the reason we have a moral law is because there is a moral law giver. And the Bible makes us understand in Romans 2, 14 and 15 that God put a conscience on our inside to be able to distinguish between good and evil. And so we had eight of that argument to prove the existence of God. And when we were done proving the existence of God, we went into looking at the nature of God. And we said God is principally a spirit being. John 4, 24, Jesus was speaking about God and he said, God is a spirit and he said, they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And we said, on the strength of that, our God is not visible to the physical eye, neither is he tangible to the material being. Are you following that? So if someone asks you, where is your God? I want to see him. His spirit. And because his spirit, you can't see him with your naked eye, neither can you touch him. However, we said, there are three major ways he gives expression to his nature in order for us to affirm his tangibility. And we said the first way is through his love. The Bible said in 1 John 4, 8 that God is love. And because of God's love, God is always predisposed to helping, to interacting and relating with us in love. For example, John 3, 16 said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So at some point, you must experience the love of God. And so interacting with the love of God becomes one of the ways of touching his, of, of making contact with him tangibly. And then we spoke about the fact that God is light. First John chapter 1 verse 5, the Bible said, this is the message that we have received, that God is light and in him there is no darkness. And we said the revelation of God being light is the fact that intrinsically and inherently in his creation, there is a measure of wisdom that he puts in us to help us go about our life and our existence. In John chapter 1 verse 4, it said, in him was life, the life was the light of men. So everyone who is created has a measure of wisdom that helps him navigate through life in a reasonable and prospective manner. That revelation and that wisdom is God lightening his path. Job said in Job 29 verse 4, he said, As I was in the days of my youth, when the secret of God was upon my tabernacle, he said, By light I walk through darkness. So there is no man who is in perpetual darkness. At least God will give you enough life to choose him when you come into this world. And this is why you preach to people and they accept God. The message sometimes is not so intelligent, but there is an intuitive, you know, interaction on their inside that affirms that what you are saying is the way. And they get to accept God because of what you are saying, because there is a measure of life or light in everyone. And then we say, finally, this spirit being gives expression to himself in the form of fire. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 27, verse 29 the Bible said our God is a consuming fire. And we said that speaks of his judgment, his authority, his rulership, and his dominion. And we said it's on account of that that when a man errs, there is a sense of judgment that he feels for his evil and for his iniquity. When a man gets to a point where he does what is wrong and his conscience does not prick him, prick him neither does he feel any sense of judgment, then you know that that man is dead. 
So long as you are active and alive, there will be a weight of judgment that you feel every time you walk in the path of error. That is the consuming fire. And we said, blessed are you if you feel it here. Because if you don't feel it here, you will feel it in the form of a lake in the afterlife. Because there's such a thing called the lake of fire, which is the second death. So those who don't feel it here, we feel it there. Glory to God. But thank God we feel it here and we are convicted to do the right thing while we are yet here. Because our God is a consuming fire. So the nature of our God is as a spirit. He manifests that nature in form of love, in form of light, and in form of fire. And then we said his nature has certain attributes that makes him stand in his own class. And we divided those attributes into two major attributes. We spoke about the essential attributes and we spoke about the moral attributes. And we said there are about seven to eight essential attributes of God. And we said these essential attributes are the attributes that define his inward character and he cannot share them. And we listed them. We said number one, is that God is eternal. That means he has no beginning, he has no end. There has never been a time where God is not. He predates existence. In fact, existence comes from within him. He is eternal. God has always been and God will always be. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.17 calls him the eternal God. Number two, we say God is self-existent. That means he wasn't created. And it doesn't exist because of anyone. God is the only being that is the reason for his own existence. Every other being is living for God, but God is living for himself. So God's purpose is in God. He doesn't derive his purpose from any being because he's self-existent. And we said in Exodus chapter 3 verse 14, he said to Moses, Tell them, I am that I am have sent you. I live for, who I, for myself, I am who I am, and I will be what I will be. It has nothing to do with any being. I find meaning in myself. And it's on the strength of that that every creation depends on me. And then we said number three, God is immutable. That means God cannot change and God has never changed. And on the strength of his immutability, he can be trusted because he's reliable. Whatever he says, that's what he will do. He will never change. Malachi 3.6, he said, I am the Lord. I change not. Therefore, you, the children of Israel, you are not consumed. And then we went further to number four. We said God is omnipotent. And we said as omnipotent, he has all powers. That means there is nothing impossible for God to do. And we said he doesn't just have all powers. He also has the authority to put his power under his will. That means his power does not control him. He controls his power. There are people who have power and they can't control themselves anymore. God is not like that. Although he possesses all powers, but all powers, all his powers, is subjected to his will. It's in that context that he is holy, even while possessing all powers. Are we following this? Revelation chapter 9 verse 16, the Bible said, The Lord God, omnipotent, reigneth. And then we said he is omniscient. And so we say as omniscient, he knows all things. At all times and in all times. That means there is nothing in creation or outside of creation that God does not know. And God does not just know things created. God also knows everything inside of himself. You know God is bigger than existence. He gives you an idea how big God is. So God does not just know everything in existence. God knows everything inside of God. At all times and in all times. In fact, it's impossible for God to learn. He can't learn anything. Because he already knows all things. Are you following this? However, we also added that although he knows all things, he is incorruptible. So the knowledge of God does not corrupt him. So he has the power to know all things and remain incorruptible while he possesses all knowledge. Are you following? Because he is omniscient. And then we went further to say he is omnipresent. That means he is everywhere, at every time, in every place. There has never been a place where God is not. And we said not just at every time, but in every time. If we say God is everywhere at every time, it means right now that we are here, God is everywhere. But if we say God is everywhere in every time, that means every time that has been, God is and still is. What it means is that God is still in yesterday. He has not left yesterday. He is in today and is already in tomorrow. 
Because if God is not in everywhere, in every time, creation will collapse. Because he's the one who sustains creation. And you know, existence is like an algorithm. If you remove tomorrow from existence, the metric will collapse. So God is still in yesterday, he's still in last year, and he's in every time that has been, both in time and in eternity. And he's already in every time until the end. That's what it means by being everywhere. And we said the reason we are explaining these things is to help us build faith in God. The psalmist said, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death? He said, I fear no evil. Why? Because thou art with me. He knows that even in his worst situation, God is there. That's why the Bible said, if you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. If you walk through the water, you will not be drowned. Because anywhere you are, God is there. It is your faith and consciousness in him that makes his presence conse consequential. So if a man does not believe in God or have the consciousness of God, then God's presence will not be consequential. Why do we feel the tangible presence of God here? Because we have decided in worship to build our consciousness of him. So his power becomes tangible here. But it doesn't mean God is only in this service. God is everywhere. But it takes faith in him and consciousness of him for his presence to become tangible. In fact, the psalmist was speaking and said, even if he goes to hell, God is there. But you cannot feel the tangibility of his presence there because that's not a realm where they have faith in God. And that's not a realm where they are conscious of God. And that's not a realm where they worship God. So although his presence is there, but the tangibility cannot be felt. So God is everywhere, at every time, in every time. He is omnipresent. And finally, we said God is omnibenevolent. That means God is able to give everything in his love, including himself. He has the power to give everything, including himself. It's on the strength of that that he saved humanity. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So God can give anything, including himself. It's an expression of the love of God. Because the love of God is not necessarily emotion. Emotion is a part of it, but the love of God is a power to give himself unconditionally. So you don't need to deserve God for God to give himself to you. His love will compel him to give himself to you so that your life is better. Only God operates like that. And that's why he's called omnibenevolent. And we said these seven qualities of his nature is what makes him deity because there's no other being that possesses this quality any being that possesses this quality qualifies to be deity and that being can be worshipped it is in the context of omnipotence that is creator it's in the context of omnipotence that he can give life so any being that possesses this essential quality go and worship him he's god but only one possesses that quality. And that's the one we are talking about. We said he also possesses moral qualities. And we said the moral qualities of God are basically four. We said number one is that he's absolutely holy. And we said absolute holiness speaks of the fact that God is in his own class. There is none operating in the class where God is. And we said absolute holiness also speaks of purity that cannot be defied. That means the class where God operates from, nothing can enter that class. So God is undefilable. On the strength of that, he is the only creature that possesses the quality of absolute purity. And that quality is a moral attribute of God. And we said moral attributes of God are communicable. Because this is the point where God resonates with his creation. Every creation God has created, especially man, he wants to have a relationship with that creation. And for us who are men in particular, he doesn't just want to have a relationship with us. He wants us to function in his own class of existence. That's why he gave us his life when he created us. However, for us to function in his class, we must share in his nature. And so we said the dimension of his nature that we share is the moral dimension. So the holiness of God is imputed into man so that man too can live holy. So the reason by the Holy Spirit we strive to live holy is because we now have a holy nature. And we said that holy nature is a moral attribute of God that is shared with us. Number two, we say God is absolutely righteous. That means God cannot err. God cannot be wrong. Anything God says and anything God does is right. 
it is a part of his nature he has the power and the knowledge to operate always as being right because it takes power and knowledge to be right he knows everything in its accurate sense and he has the power to uphold anything he says so we said in the context of his knowledge he cannot make a mistake anything he says is accurate and we say in the context of his power even if it was not so if he said it his power will make it so so when god sees darkness he says, light be you don't need to ask where would the light come from because he has said it there is light so it takes knowledge and power to be absolutely righteous and god possesses it and the beauty of it is that he shares that power with us the bible said they, they will receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life so the reason we strive towards perfection is because we have the righteous character of god are you following and we went further to say god is perfect love in fact that is his fundamental nature of expression first john 4 8 he said god is love and I told you already that this love is not just emotion, it's the ability to give himself unconditionally. This is why God tells you to forgive your enemies. So now you operate a love that is beyond reason. There's no reason to forget, forgive your enemies. He said, if a man offends you, your brother offends you 70 times, 7 times in one day, forgive him. Only somebody who has the attribute of God can forgive like that. Because what will you do if you have 10 brothers? If one offends you 70 times, 7 times in one day, if you have 10 brothers, that means <laughs> you, will, you will either pack from that location and refuse to have a brother or you, you, will do, you will do something that is unthinkable. But if you have the nature of God, you can do that. And then finally we say God is absolutely faithful. He's reliable, he's dependable, he's trustworthy. These three are his moral attributes and they speak of his goodness. That's why they are called moral attributes. I said, if these attributes are made available to any creature, then that creature becomes divine. So I said, for those of us who are born again, we are divine, but we are not deity. What's the difference between being divine and being a deity? I said, the word divine is an adjective that speaks of anything that comes from God. That's why when God gives a revelation, it's called divine revelation. So anything that comes from God is divine because the DNA of God is invested in it. And 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 4, the Bible said, He has made us to become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. In 1 John chapter 5 verse 4, it says, Whatsoever is born, not from God, of God. So it's talking about his nature. So every one of us who is born of God, we have the nature of God. So we are divine beings, but we are not deities. We are not deities because we can't be worshipped. We are not deities because we don't possess his essential attributes, but we possess his divine attributes. What's the difference between us and Jesus? The difference between us and Jesus is that Jesus possesses both the essential and moral attributes of God, but we possess only the moral attributes of God. That's why Jesus is both deity and divine. That's why you can worship Jesus because he is God. But we are his creation. We possess his moral attributes. We don't possess his essential attributes. Does that make sense? So you need to work with the consciousness that you are of God. It is in the light of this truth that you can live on earth like God. Above sin, walking in authority, ruling over demons. If you don't know these foundational truths, you'll be defeated in life. You will think you are part of a religion that is better than other religion. You will think you have moral laws that you obey so you are a better human being than other people. Listen, we are not better human beings. We are not obeying laws that make us better in character. There is a nature we possess first of all before we obey the laws of God. That nature is what places us in the class where we are. And this is why the Bible calls us new creation. We are born of God. God is in us and we are in God. We carry God's nature. This mentality and consciousness is the foundation of victorious living. And so anything that cannot defeat God, you'll refuse for that thing to defeat you. 
be it sin, be it Satan, be it poverty, be it weakness, you refuse for that thing to defeat you. And if you operate by the Holy Spirit and the word of God, you will discover that the ability to conquer will rise up on your inside and your life will move to higher levels of glory. But it begins with an understanding that you possess the moral attributes of God and in that context, divinity has been imputed into you.